Welcome to those that have joined us. Uh, this is going to be a presentation on IMAP, PET, IMAP Pests Project and Modernising Sugarcane Diagnostics. Uh, we'll be starting at eight o'clock on the dot. Just putting all my things on mute. <laughs> yeah, please, everybody put your stuff on mute unless you're presenting or asking a question. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Nicole. How are you? Good, thank you. That's good. Hi, Sophia. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Good morning. Oh, I just said hello to Sophia as well. Hi. <laughs> right. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Sophia. Morning, Rob. Morning, James. Morning to everybody who's joined us. Uh, this is going to be a presentation on IMAP's Pest Project and Modernising Sugarcane Diagnostics. Uh, we'll be starting at eight. Um, if you haven't done so, please can you put your mics on mute and less presenting. Radio, we'll make a start. Okay, so welcome to this morning presentation. Uh, taking the time to join us. So the presentation is on IMAP's pest project of modernising sugarcane diagnostics. I'm James Ogden Brown, a regional coordinator based at SRA in Bundaberg, and will be your co-host co -host this morning. This webinar presentation will be presented by your hosts, uh, Shakira Johnson. Shakira, if you'd like to raise your hand. There we are, there's Shakira. Um, so Shakira is from Ausveg, um, is the communication and extension for IMAP pests, and will provide an overview of the project and an introduction to the suite of mobile surveillance units. Uh, Dr. Nicole Thompson, um, Nick, can you raise your hand? And Nick is our principal research scientist presenting on the progress of SRA has made with modernizing sugarcane diagnostics. We're going to cover a little bit of housekeeping. Please note that today's presentation has been recorded. We encourage you to keep your microphones on mute um, to minimize background noise. If you have any technology issues, please just raise them um, and we'll try and sort them out for you. Um, we encourage you, everybody, to take an active part in today's presentation, but I do ask that we hold the questions to the end of both presentations. Um, you can either type a question, but the preference is, is that you actually ask the question in your own words, um, and that's at the end. Uh, it, when you do that, please don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay. 
On that note, I'm going to hand over to Shakira. All over to you, Shakira. Thank you. Thank you. Presenting. Can you can you see that? I don't know. Is it? Well, it I can. We can. Shakira, can you go full screen? Excellent. Yes, totally okay. Thank you. Okay, looks a little. All right, great. Okay, so. Thanks for the introduction, James. I'll get right into it. So IMAP Tests is a five-year project, $21 million of funding from the Rural R&D for Profit program out of the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. It's all about research and development into advanced pest surveillance technologies and diagnostics, and then translating and extending those insights through to industry and state and federal governments. The idea is that we want to put actionable information regarding plant pests and disease dynamics into the hands of end users. So this is a, a, a first. We have a collaboration between all of Australia's plant RDCs. Uh, we have Hort Innovation as the lead and of course sugar research are involved. We have several different research sub projects. These are led by Victoria's Agriculture Victoria, South Australia's SADI, Western Australia's DPIRD, Queensland's University of Queensland. We have some research coming in from Rothamsted Research and Burkhard Agri Samplers. And we have some contributions from Plant and Food Research and B3 out of New Zealand, and of course, Sugar Research Australia. And our monitoring and evaluation is done by Coots JNR. So the whole idea about IMAP pests is that it's a national program of research, development and extension designed to put actionable information into the hands of Australia's primary producers to enhance on-farm pest management decision making. So this all starts with good surveillance. So we're developing these mobile surveillance units we call Sentinels and samples captured by our traps on board these sentinels are sent through to uh, entomologists and diagnosticians who then review these trap samples and then we collect all the data and then push that out through engagement activities and encourage adoption of the data. All of this is designed to enhance pest management, biosecurity and area freedom. So I'll just go through each of the different components starting with SARDI's surveillance activities. SARDI play quite a major role in the IMAP Pests project because the Sentinel is, is central to the narrative of IMAP Pests. They are developing and, and constructing these mobile surveillance units we call Sentinels. And here you can see the prototype unit, Sentinel-1. The prototype features a six metre insect suction trap, a two metre insect suction trap and two onboard spore samplers. We also have a weather station on board that captures different climate data. And these uh, insect traps are designed to capture uh, at the two metre level, designed to capture those sort of hovering around the crop level. And then the six metre trap is designed to capture those more long distance migratory insect flights. On the prototype, we also have a, a, a trap system called BioScout, which is out of a startup company in Sydney. It's a near real time monitoring unit for reporting fungal pathogens that are airborne. And they can report results using machine learning and a, an on, onboard camera device. They can record and report results uh, in about four hours. We're also looking at different lure based traps and how we can incorporate those with our, our Sentinel units, marrying that climate data with some of the lure trap data and reporting that to industry. Looking at some of the surveillance technologies that DPIRD are developing, they are also looking at these lure trap devices and how they can automate the reporting of moths captured. So their focus is on native budworm and diamondback moth. And they are distributing these across Western Australia's grain belt. And they are also looking at spore trapping and different ways of monitoring green peach aphid and whether or not they are victoring beet Western yellows virus using lamp diagnostics in field. 
And they're also looking at developing an automated imaging system for apothecia germination of sclerotinia. And again, all of these traps are distributed across that Western Australian grain belt. All of the results from their trap and sensor data and their agronomic interpretations are extended to growers and consultants through their pest facts newsletter, which is supported by GRDC. So onto the pest and disease diagnostics component, there are a few different sub projects. We have Sadi, whose uh, entomologists will review and um, morphologically identify some of the insect targets in those trap samples. And the Molecular Diagnostics Centre processes the pathogen samples um, using their high throughput molecular assays. DPERT are doing a little bit of diagnostics as well, as I mentioned, with the green peach aphid um, vectoring viruses using LAMP. And they also have some of their biosecurity fungal plant pathologists looking at those spore traps to identify any uh, exotic targets of interest. They're also looking into the use of LAMP in field to uh, assess the level of fungal pathogens. We have AgVic using high throughput sequencing for the broad scale detection of insect targets with a particular focus on identifying biosecurity targets. And they're also looking at how to apply this technology to a group of fungal pathogens within the Ophiostomoid group, which is associated with uh, a major exotic threat to Australia's forestry industry, the chestnut blight. Then we have Sugar Research Australia, modernising their molecular toolkit for sugar pests and pathogens, and University of Queensland updating uh, molecular toolkit for cotton pests and pathogens. And they are using high throughput sequencing to understand feeding behaviour uh, of a range of pests. And if we can better understand which hosts these pests are feeding on between seasons. So I think the outcomes of this will be quite interesting in combination with these. So Ausveg in the beginning of the project uh, wanted to uh, look at all of the different high priority pests and pathogens across the different industries. And while there are some synergies across some of the industries, some industries have quite unique pathogen uh, and, and pest issues. So we developed a list of about, it fluctuates depending on the site, but it's about 30 uh, endemic insects and pathogens. And these are all airborne because our traps are capturing airborne targets. And we consulted with various um, industries and state and federal governments. Now, I just want to point out here, we've got for sugar specifically, we have sugar cane plant hopper and sugar cane smut. Now, sugar cane smut is a part of a, a list of fungal pathogens that the uh, SARDI MDC have to, <clears throat> excuse me, develop molecular assays for. And very recently, they completed the development of a sugar cane smut assay. So we're now able to report on the presence and prevalence of sugar cane smut in these pathogen samples. These samples go through to the entomologists at SADI, as I mentioned earlier, and they work through all these pots and record them um, on an online system. And it's then sent to the cloud space where we can access the data. And then we have the pathogen samples going to MDC. And I've just shown you a little excerpt of our data outputs here. This is from our first trial last year at the Hart Field site in South Australia, which is a grain site. And here we've just reported a, a summary of some of our aphid targets, but all of our data and information is shared through our website, imappests.com.au. And I encourage all of you to visit the website and provide any feedback. We, we, um, have a little way to go on, on diversifying. So far, we've been stuck in South Australia, but we soon will be presenting some of our outcomes from Moringa. So I'll just, oops, I don't want to go to the IMAP PIS website. So I'll just go into some of these Sentinel units now. So as I mentioned before, this is the prototype. It's got the six metre insect suction trap, the two metre, the bio scout, and so on and so forth. We've had a few trials so far, one at Hart, that grains-based site, 
one at Nuriutpa, which is in the Barossa Valley, so a viticulture site. And then it traveled all the way up to Cairns for a trial at the Moringa site uh, for Sugar Research Australia. But all of these trials uh, enabled us to gain a lot of insight into the operation and functionality of this unit. And that's enabled us to optimize future designs for the other Sentinels. Uh, I'll just go into the Moringa site outcome. So this is a, I really love this photo. Here's Nicole, and we've got a couple of Department of Agriculture people here. This was from our trial at the Moringa site. And I can give you some of the outcomes. Unfortunately, no, well, fortunately, really, no detection of sugarcane plant hopper was, was uh, recorded. We did have one detection of an exotic, the Asian honeybee. However, this was likely from this known local colony in the Cairns area. And there were limited quantities of hort pathogen targets, such as sclerotinia and botrytis, not, not too high. But thanks to MDC recently completing the sugarcane smut assay, we can show you some of those results. So what you're looking at here is just a snapshot from our live data dashboard. We have the environmental data here. In orange, this is the percentage of relative humidity. In blue, the temperature. And in green, the rainfall. Down here, you have the results from both spore traps spore trap A and spore trap B, and you can see peaks in detection here. Now, we just got these results in, they're hot off the press, but you can probably draw some patterns and maybe Rob would be, would be best tasked to comment on this, but you can see after a period of rainfall and high humidity, you're seeing peaks in detection. We do have some questions that we'd like to answer about the uh, differences in numbers between this spore trap and this spore trap. And that's something that uh, we, we can look at um, across these uh, trials and make sure that our traps are performing as best as they can. So unfortunately, during this trial, COVID-19 pandemic hit Australia, borders closed, we had to bring it back to South Australia. But that let us uh, focus on bringing all of these units together and um, developing um, more of them based on, on those insights that we had from those trials. So this one here is Sentinel-2. It's slightly different. You can see the solar panel array is set up on these wings that sit outside the Sentinel as opposed to that separate panel that you see on Sentinel-1. So this is more of a revised prototype. Uh, we delivered this one in May and sent it out into the field in July. This is Sentinel-3, affectionately known as our dumb trailer or our dumb Sentinel, which is not very nice, but it's just because it's not as smart or high tech as Sentinel-1 and 2. We are working through automating each of the traps on here, but you can see a six metre trap here, which is a manual setup, unlike the pneumatic six metre trap on Sentinels 1 and 2, and there's a one uh, one spore sampler and one two metre trap, and then it's got its uh, onboard weather station and a solar array panel for power. During lockdown, we also revised the delivery of future Sentinels based on learnings from Sentinel, oop, uh, previous, Sentinels 1, 2 and 3. So the idea is that Sentinels 4, 5 and 6 would be more flexible, more cost effective, and uh, we could adapt them for different industry needs. So I'll skip through to Sentinel 4. So this is our latest unit that we have um, rolled out recently, just a couple of weeks old. You'll notice this is much smaller than Sentinels 1 and 2. It features one spore sampler, one two metre trap, and an onboard weather station. This can be deployed off the back of a trailer or a ute and it has its own standalone frame. Currently it is plugged into mains power but soon it will be uh, featuring an integrated solar array panel which will just be a panel that sits off to the side. Now Sentinel-6 will be identical so again another unit featuring the two meter trap and the spore trap but Sentinel-5 will feature that manual 
six metre trap again. Now, this is just a, a, a design from uh, sort of adapted from the CAD drawings. It hasn't been delivered yet, but we're expecting to roll it out in December. This again is deployed off the back of a trailer or ute. We can adapt which traps are featured on this unit and they will sit inside these boxes here. So next for us, uh, we are looking at where we want to focus in 2021 on where the Sentinels will be rolled out across Australia. We'd like to diversify beyond South Australia. And we are consulting with industry to understand when we can place these units across the country and how best to share the information and, and encourage adoption of the data and how people are using it. Um, again, I encourage you to visit the IMAP PEST website, but thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thanks very much. Thank you very Thank much, Shakira. Um, um, we'll, we're just, just going to hold, hold questions, questions to the end. end. Um, so, so can I hand over, over to you yourself, yourself next? Thanks. No, no worries. I will just get this happening. Okay, can you see my screen? Can see it. Yes, clearly. Good. I. All right. So um, as Shaq has given a really good introduction to um, the IMAP PEST project. What I'm going to do is talk about what we are doing um, in SRA as part of this project. So um, the people in SRA who are working on this project, it's um, myself, I'm the project lead, and then Kevin is uh, doing the entomology work, and Chung is doing the molecular and high throughput sequencing work, and Ray is our technician who is doing the hard yards. So um, this is just a recap for those people who went to our, um, who have been attending at these webinars regularly. Um, this is just a reminder that we have a lot of established diseases in Australia, in sugarcane, um, such as mosaic, Fiji leaf, or smart, RSD, et cetera, et cetera. But we have even more exotic pests and diseases, some of which you can see pictures of here. Um, at the end of each of those talks, we did talk about how diagnostics are important. They're important to detect and identify correctly pathogens and pests. And this is for uh, incursion, surveillance, quarantine, research. So diagnostics are very important. What we are doing in the SRA specific aims of IMAP pests is we're firstly, we're modernising the diagnostic tools that we have for pathogens. So there is a lot of pathogens and pests, but not all of them have had sort of attention, I guess, to modernise or to look at new methods for diagnostics. And so that's one of the aims of our uh, project. Secondly, is to look at high throughput sequencing, which um, Jacques, Jacques has said is already used in, um, in the IMAP pest project as well. But we want to get a toolkit that would be specific for sugarcane and looking at new diseases or um, multiplexing uh, disease diagnostics, looking at different strains where specific tests may fail. And the third part is looking at our moth borer threats. Um, Kevin has talked a little bit about these in his entomology talk. I'm going to talk about what we found in this project with regards to our um, moth borer research. And this part of the project was actually delivered by the Australian Museum uh, in conjunction with Kevin. And this is mainly looking at what species are where, in the, in the world and that are threats to Australia. So I don't expect you to, um, rec uh, to memorise this entire table, but basically what I want to point out is that we have a range of diseases here, which we, when we looked at what we had and what we were using as our current tests, some of these are very, very odd. Some of people on this seminar may be younger than some of the tests we do. So obviously, there's room for improvement in our diagnostics. These are also, you'll notice some of these are endemic, uh, as in they are in Australia, and some are exotic, so they are overseas, or some are. So some of them are exotic and some are endemic. 
And some of these tests are really um, annoying to do, some are okay. Um, but what we wanted to do is to upgrade our tests and maybe change them over. So we need to develop new tests, have a look at new tests, develop new tests, and then see if they are better than what we have. You'll also notice these are in three lots. I'm going to just talk about these first three today because these are the first three we're looking at in this project. As Shaq said, this is part of the project. So these this work is, I would say, 99 to 100% complete. This work is the next tab of uh, diseases off the rank and these ones back later. So what is our research plan? So first thing we need to do so you see some of these are found overseas as well. A lot of the pathogens are overseas. So there are tests already published. Maybe they only need to be optimised for sugarcane. We also wanted to know, you know, are we, are we looking at the right part of the sugarcane plant when we're doing our diagnostics? Are we missing something by sampling the wrong part? So we looked at looking at uh, sugarcane parts as well. <clears throat> as I said, the current methods, some of them between 10 and 30 years old, and there is newer technology there, newer diagnostics. Is it better? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to test these new methods on control samples that we know are positive and compare them to the existing methods and then come to a conclusion as to which tests may be the future rather than the past. So I'm going to talk about our plant part assay, um, which is looking at what part of the plant we want to uh, extract from. Then I'm going to go through the three uh, diseases that we've done, which is uh, sugarcane mosaic virus, uh, leaf scald, and sugarcane yellow leaf. These three, which you may have questions about, these are the next three off the rank. So firstly, are we sampling the best part of the plant? So what we did for this experiment is we took an entire sugarcane stalk and we dissected this into every leaf every internode, parts of the leaf, parts of the internode, and the roots. So in the leaves, we looked at the leaf lamina, which is the green part of the leaf, the majority of the leaf, the midrib, which runs down the centre, and then the leaf sheath, which sticks the leaf onto the plant or where it starts growing. In the stalk, we looked at the inside, the pith, the rind on the outside, and then we also looked at the buds. And we then also looked at the internodes and the roots under the ground as well. We took the same amount of tissue from these parts in um, replicated forms and then we extracted them and measured the recovery. Now, the results, this may look a little confusing, so I will talk you through what we have here. So on the left-hand side here, you'll see the same diagram that we had before. If you can't look at the leaves, they're all numbered. They are numbered from the first visible dewlap, which is here as number one. And as you then progress up the stalk, it goes minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. And as you go down, it goes two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, which is starting to senesce. In fact, seven is starting to senesce and nine is just about four. The stalk we label from the top to the bottom, uh, the internodes, and uh, then also had a look at the roots as well. So when you extract DNA, we started with a set amount, the same weight of tissue that we started with. If you're looking at the leaf, these are the three parts of the leaf. We've got the lamina, the midrib, and the sheath in these colours. The first thing that you should notice is that we actually get a, consistently a lot more DNA out of leaf lamina, which is what we were expecting, than the midrib and then the sheath. We also notice that in this sort of upper part of the plant, um, you are getting a nice high amount at this S minus one, which is here, which is good for us to know because that's usually what we'd ask to get sent to us for diagnostic. We usually say, take the first or second unfurled leaf, which is nice to know that we're actually selecting the right part of the plant. When we look at the stalk going from the top to the bottom, the first thing you need to notice is this scale here. This is only five nanograms per microliter, which is in here. So the yield is a lot lower. This is not unexpected because a lot of the soil is obviously made up of vacuoles, which doesn't, and um, not made up of very much uh, tissue. So this isn't unexpected to see this. Um, so we have the pith, and then this is the rind. So you do get more DNA in the rind than you do in the pith. 
until, it's, interestingly, you go below the surface and then we're getting more DNA in the pith than the rock. Um, this is probably a function of the fact that those internodes under the ground are pretty short. However, when you're looking at the stalking, you're looking at that bud or the eye tissue, we are getting a really high amount of recoverable DNA from the eye tissue. And this was a surprise to us. And it is actually stands as maybe a good alternative when we can't get leaf tissue if the plant has been top, something like that, and we want to test, do want to test that um, plant, we can take a, a, a bud and we can extract the DNA and still get fairly high concentrations of um, DNA out of the bud. If you go underground, first thing is that you get a lot of variation. So um, it's not generally as, as clear cut. You do tend to get a, quite a lot of variation under the ground. <clears throat> so as a conclusion, <coughs> excuse me, the leaf minus the minus one um, around about the second, first, uh, unfurled leaf is good. Still get really good DNA right until you start getting senescence of the leaf. And there is more DNA in the lamina than the midrib tissue. Not really very much surprise there. The surprise for us was that the bud or the eye can be used and you can get high concentrations of DNA. Not unsurprising, you can't get a lot of DNA out of the stem and that the roots are quite variable. Um, and that interesting finding there's more DNA in the pith underground than in So I'm going to just switch tack now and talk about the different diagnostic methods that we're investigating, just in case you're not familiar. So the first one is uh, quantitative PCR or qPCR. In parts of this talk, I'll talk about RT-qPCR. That's basically the same method. This is very accepted, very well established in diagnostics. If you have had a COVID test, it will have gone through a PCR, qPCR test. It's very sensitive, but it does require specialist equipment. The other method, which Shaq also talked about, is LAMP. It's a loop-mediated amplification. This is a little bit of a newer method, and it is reported to be very specific and very sensitive, <clears throat> and it, that it can be used in field detection because it doesn't require so much specialist equipment. Our LAMP, we are doing it in a, uh, a machine called Genie, yes. I think the engineers had fun naming their um, machine to do lamp, genie, genie comes with lamp anyway. Um, basically, this method you, is quite complicated, but it's, it's complicated in its chemistry, but quite simple in its setup. So basically, you end up amplifying a large amount of very specific DNA, which is then detected by either a... Um, chemiluminescence or some sort of detection method there where you're looking at the amount of DNA. So the first disease that we were looking at was sugar cane mosaic virus. So just a call back to the last seminar um, which we talked about diseases. There is the potty virus and it is transmitted by aphids. Now in Australia we only have one strain of sugar cane mosaic virus, uh, it's called strain A, and it is only really in two or three places in Australia, um, Isis, Good, and um, Rocky Point. But overseas there are many other strains of sugar cane mosaic virus and other potty viruses which infect sugar cane. <clears throat> so when we're doing diagnostics for material inside of Australia, we do a um, uh, uh, specific RT-PCR uh, using this S400 set of primers. But if we're looking for exotic things, we need to go back to using an ELISA. Now, ELISAs are less sensitive than um, PCRs, uh, but they, are, they can be more generic. So we sacrifice the, the sensitivity for being able to detect a wide range. So what we wanted to do was to see if we could get a PCR that would be able to replace the ELISA or a LAMP. So what we did, we developed a LAMP assay. We developed a one-step RT-PCR uh, generic bodyvirus assay and a one-step RT-QPCR assay. So the QPCR assay is the quantitative one that's very, very good. And what did we find? Well, the QPCR was much more sensitive. Um, 
I think the ELISA really only uh, the two-step uh, generic PCR that we were using would only really detect down to about one in 100, one in 1,000. The qPCR was really sensitive and it could detect down to one in one million dilution of our infected material, which is fantastic. Interestingly, also, the qPCR and LAMP have detected mosaic in a sample which we had previously said was negative, and this was a survey sample from overseas. So that's quite interesting, so saying that it's actually more sensitive than the previous tests. The qPCR also can detect other sugarcane infecting potty virus, such as sort of mosaic virus. One set of the primers that we had was that we designed was really good at doing that as well. We also detected um, in a dual infection, we have some striate mosaic specimens here at Woodford, which we tested, and they came up with dual mosaic virus as well. Not surprising, Woodford is the home of every disease, so everything gets everything eventually. Um, but it was very interesting that that, that came up in a dual infection. <clears throat> so for us, we think that this qPCR, one step RT qPCR is more likely to be, is very likely to be a replacement for our current advisor. More sensitive, and it seems to, in, at this stage, be able to detect viruses that we're worried about. Now we'll just switch over to leaf scald. So leaf scald is a bacterial pathogen, mainly in the xylem, but you do get some amount of bacteria in the lines as well. Again, this is a pathogen that's found in Australia, but overseas there are different serotypes, different variants of this pathogen. Now, our current assay for leaf scald is one of the most time-consuming assays that we have. We have to have a mature plant, we have to blow the juice, plate it out, wait for three days, and then do a PCR. So it's very time-consuming. No quick assay for leaf scald. However, overseas, there is some suggestion that PCR or qPCR can be done on leaf. We have actually tested this once or twice, um, but we only really got it to work if there was this uh, this pencil line. <clears throat> but as this is an important pathogen all around the world, there are a lot of different published methods. So we really didn't need to do very much design. We just needed to research first. One thing that was missing was a lamp, a lamp assay. So we developed the lamp and then we used those published tests and we did a dilution series of looking at the bacteria and see how good or bad the assays are. What did we find? <clears throat> Firstly, the um, SRA developed lamp was better than the published lamp, which was um, really good. However, it wasn't super sensitive. It only really went down to dilutions of one in 10,000. Um, QPCR, using one set of existing primers, went to one in 10,000 and sometimes down to one in 100,000. Uh, the one drawback of this is that this is tested on a <coughs> on a culture. So we do have some uh, growing plants now, which we're going to be testing as well, um, because there'll be a difference between a culture and a real specimen out of it. So we are just going to be just doing that in the background as that project progresses. We did try testing some quarantine samples, but unfortunately we didn't have any um, leaf scored in our, in our uh, quarantine, which is Good to not intercept a disease, but also bad because we didn't get to test our numbers. The third and final disease that we have finished developing is looking at sugarcane yellow leaf virus. Now in Australia, um, it doesn't cause very much yield loss, but overseas it can cause up to 30% yield loss, which has it's been reported in some varieties, <clears throat> which leads us to think there's possibly a different strain in Australia. Um, or there's some difference in our genotype, uh, genotypic background or environmental conditions for expressing and getting a really bad disease in Australia. We know that there are many different strains of yellow leaf virus, and the PCR, RT-PCR that we're currently using is one that was developed by CIRAD in 2010, which was published in 2012. It's the most up-to-date test that we're using. This virus is very low in titer, which means there's not a lot of virus in a lot of the plant. Uh, it's concentrated a lot in the midrib, which we already know is lower to get any DNA out. So we need a di diagnostic test that will detect all the strains and be very sensitive. So as I said, like leaf score, this has got many, many uh, 
tests published and many unpublished tests that we also uh, were able to uh, get to have a look at. We did develop a one-step RTQ-PCR. We compared this to our existing tests. We had two sets of really good-looking primers, and one of them we had to get rid of, and I'll just come to that in a minute. But what we did do is we tested the primers on a range of different genotypes of the, of the virus, which we have in our collection. Um, we obviously don't have everything in our collection, um, but we, you know, we've got a fairly good range. And those current primers, those uh, existing primers, they were pretty good. They um, just had to change a little bit of um, uh, the parameters, but they were detecting down to a 1 in 10,000 dilution quite reliably. But when we looked at the RTQ-PCR that was developed, we were getting that really good sensitivity of the dilution down to 1 in 10,000. As I said, we developed two sets of primers and we were getting some unusual results. Um, and when we looked into it more, we found that one of those sets was amplifying sugarcane if there was too much sugarcane in the sample. So if we started with, if we had too much sugarcane DNA. So we ditched that one and that really worked quite well. If you look at the lamp, the lamp, published lamp for yellow leaf virus was really not good at all. So that only really detected down to so that's the finish of that first section. Our next, the next section I'm going to talk about is our high throughput sequencing. So it's a different way of doing diagnostics. Basically, you take a plant, you extract all of the DNA, you sequence it, and then you use iterative uh, DNA program analysis programs to put those sequences back together. And then you query a database and see if you have found any. This has been used for Ramu stunt and Cardiac Streak. Um, USDA are using this a lot for um, characterising sugarcane viruses. We really don't have a pipeline here for analysing these samples. So that is kind of the aim of what our project is to do. We have been collaborating with other people using high throughput sequencing, including people from the Enzyme Pest Group, our overseas colleagues, other high throughput sequencing uh, users in our uh, in diagnostics but also outside of diagnostics and the first set of data has just been received um, Chung just received it uh, I think last week uh, it's passed our quality control and we're doing the analysis now so that one includes a range of different sugarcane specimens from plants with really visible symptoms to no symptoms known samples and unknown samples so that is the information that we third and final part of this project is looking at these mothballs. So as we know, um, exotic mothballs are the highest priority pest for Australian sugarcane. <clears throat> there was reported to be about 36 major species worldwide in four families. There is very high threat to Australia and you will know some of these names, Sesamia, Sfarga, Kylo, Eldana. So you've heard these before. These mothboras are high risk, not only because they're devastating, but also because they're geographically very close. And a lot of these species have very extensive geographic protein. <clears throat> However, the existing taxonomic resources when we started this project was very limited in scope, and where those species were was quite unclear. So we had research in two overlapping areas, a DNA-based and morphological, putting those together to give us some really so, this work on moth virus, this was done by the Australian Museum and Kevin, and what that we looked at was um, all of the high risk, most of the medium risk and some other low risk uh, species. We looked at the uh, two different parts of the genome and we also looked at the morphology <coughs> where we had specimens available. So these were all from existing specimens that collections. Our findings, one of the first findings was that, well, the databases, uh, some of them are wrong, uh, some are incomplete, and so these have been updated where they can be, they have been corrected. We also found there were two species of Sesamia um, in these areas uh, from the DNA analysis. Uh, it gave a nice clear result there. The Scirpophaga had a really good link between DNA sequence and geographic location, which is actually quite interesting from a Persian point of view. And Kylo did show 
different result based on the gene analyzed. So this all work to be <clears throat> so this work has all been published. There was an AWSCT paper, I believe, and I think um, other papers have been published about this. So if you need more information about this, um, I will direct you to Kevin and to the papers. What are our conclusions for in purpose of this project? So firstly, what we did is we updated the species assessment information in database and collections. This is really important because if you think about it, if we get an incursion, and we're comparing it to something and the database is wrong, then you've got nowhere to go. So it's very important to have update information in databases and in the collections. We've also got new dossiers, which are kind of information packs um, for these um, exotic moth borers, and we're going to be endorsing them and um, publishing those in due course. Diagnostic protocols are being updated um, as well. And the geographic distribution of the moth borers is also being updated. So you can see here a nice picture that Kevin has given me. Um, this is the distribution of Kylo, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Um, <clears throat> but you can see here that these Kylos are through PNG, Indonesia, and then they up and through Asia. So this is being done for the, uh, in, for the moth borers that we have studied in this project. What are our conclusions? What are the take home messages from this talk? Well, firstly, we have been developing new diagnostic tests for a range of diseases. We really want to modernise our methods in the lab. I don't want to be using tests that are older than me. It's like a car. You don't want to drive a car that's older than yourself. We're also looking at high throughput sequencing, developing that for investigating known and importantly, looking at unknown pathogens. Now, if you Remember back to what I said about why we used ELISA because ELISA was really good at detecting uh, in mosaic. It's very good at detecting things that are not necessarily 100% what you're looking for. So it will detect sorghum mosaic virus if you sugarcane mosaic virus. Sometimes if you make your test extremely specific, you might miss things that are a little bit different. So high throughput sequencing is there to kind of fill in those gaps. And also our moth, prepare, moth borer preparedness is greatly improved through this project. So we have some really good now information now where the moths are, um, which ones are going to be the higher threats. We've got better information about how to diagnose those. Accurately. And finally, um, being part of the IMAP-PEST project, uh, this big rural R&D project has allowed us to collaborate with other industries for diagnostics and surveillance. So we're not out there on our own. A lot of the tests that we're developing specifically can be then used for sentinel surveillance and we can complement each other in our research, which is why you might have noticed on the table that Shaq had, there wasn't very many sugarcane pathogens listed. That's because we're doing a lot of sugarcane pathogens. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Great presentation both from both of you guys. Um, so from that, are there any questions for either Nick or Shakira? Um, if you could either raise your hand um, preferably and ask them verbally or type them in the box. That looks like a question for Shakira. <laughs> okay, take myself off mute. So the data custodian is Hort Innovation as the lead RDC. However, the data is publicly accessible on the website at imappests.com.au. So the data for our Moringa site is not currently live, but since we received the sugarcane smart data, we'll be uploading that to our new look website, which should launch tomorrow. So if you're interested to have a poke around, but during the trials, the data is shared through a data dashboard where you can click on each of the different targets that are relevant to that site and then interrogate the data further. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Can you see that question there? I'm not sure. I think, Shakira, that one's for you. Yeah, so uh, the currently uh, it depends on which unit we're talking about, but the earlier units, Sentinel 1 and 2, they have um, expensive trap features. So the pneumatic system for the six metre trap is quite costly. And I think Sentinel-1 has so far come out at somewhere between $150,000 to $200,000, uh, which, which is why we reviewed those units and, and the future rollout of, of the additional units. And the, the new ones are looking, I, I, I think the last estimate was about $75,000. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what Sentinel-5 will cost because it does feature a six metre trap, which is quite valuable. Are there any other major insects or spores, et cetera, that cannot be detected? And are there plans to increase the scope of detection? Within the scope of this project, under the time frame that we have, we can be flexible about which insects we are able to detect. If the entomologists are given a list, they can look for those. We can also collaborate with, there, there are talks to send some of our Moringa samples to Kevin Powell at, um, at the Moringa site, so he can interrogate those samples and then report those to industry. We also um, have looked at those trap samples through the high throughput sequencing method at AgVic. So we can possibly report on the biodiversity, just not the quantities of those insects. I think the, the spore assays are a little bit trickier because they need to develop the assays within MDC. However, beyond the lifetime of the project, there is opportunity for any diagnostic lab, any, any lab with that kind of capacity to uh, use their diagnostic assays to um, assess those spores. Sorry, I'm just seeing a few more questions coming in. Um, compatible with Plant Health Australia's Oz Pest Check. We actually have in our cloud-based system, um, it, it kicks out an Excel spreadsheet with all of the data captured by the Sentinel that meets the minimum data specifications outlined for, uh, well, the international specifications that are aligned with Oz Pest Check. This one's for you, Nicole. <laughs> Um, I'll also just, um, I'll just uh, quickly add on to Rob Miller's question. So, Rob, we, um, as you saw, we've got a lot of tests that we're developing and um, a SMUT for us was really a proof of concept for saying, like, if we can't detect sugarcane SMUT in the spore traps at Moringa, we're not going to be able to detect anything, basically. So that really was a proof of concept and there is really a lot of different um, uh, you, you test like we're developing tests that can be used on those sentinel samples. So in the future, there'll be much more going back and forward. Um, I could see, you know, this project is finite um, and, you know, in a stage two where if somebody wanted to you, you analyse or interrogate sentinel, sentinel trap information, that would be then analysable by any lab. So, um, yeah, that's what we're sort of doing. Um, Priya just asked me, I'm recommend, planning on recommending which tissue to target for each of the different diseases. Um, not really, Priya, but we do, we did do, um, <clears throat> for the plant that we dissected from was actually infected with sugarcane mosaic virus. So we can, once we uh, go through all that information again, we will be able to say which part is best for sugarcane mosaic virus, but that's found throughout the entire plant. We are planning to look at leaf spores because that is something that is um, quite variable um, as it's found in the in the xylem. So we'll be looking a little bit, but it'll be targeted, not, not as general as just looking at that. And uh, Graham, Graham's got a question for you, Nick. Uh, Can you see it? Ah, okay. 
So, yes, I can see that, Graham. Um, so was the purpose to know, the purpose of that was really to see twofold. Um, one was to inform us as to what part of the plant we want to send for high throughput sequencing. Um, because if you are looking at uh, a pathogen which is in the store, we may need to extract more DNA than uh, than you may for something else, for example. Um, as for do we expect the pests uh, in each part to be different, that's a good question. Um, I can only really say that the for the sugarcane mosaic virus, and Chun may correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong I think we found the sugarcane mosaic virus in every part of the plant except the roots. Is that right, Chung? Yes. Yeah. So the, the, the sugarcane mosaic virus was not in the roots, um, which is the way that it is. Um, as for looking at insect pests, I, I don't really, I'm really sure. Um, we'll have to have a look at that. So Shakira and, and Nick, a question from me is, so this is a work in progress um, and we'll have a more extensive library of pests that are investigated. You spoke about that, Nick. Um, Shakira, you've got version five, I think it was, of these mobile units. Um, so it's, it's all a work in progress at this stage. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. Yeah, this project is not finished yet. I think it's got until 2022, is that right? Yeah, we, we've recently been granted a, an extension pending certain things. Yeah, that, due to COVID really, because um, COVID did really put a big crimp on plans, as you can expect if you need to drive a Sentinel unit somewhere um, and then <laughs> it's not really very convenient when you can't get across the border. So um, even with borders opening up, we've we've had delays in delivery of onboard batteries or weather stations um, with the impact seen overseas. You know, a lot of this comes, a lot of these materials come out of Hong Kong or China, and so slowed down delivery. Yeah, and then so that that covers off on the Sentinel progress. We've got different versions, um, different uh, methods of detecting, etc. But Nick, on your side, with the different diseases and insects, that's progressing, isn't it? I mean, you talked about the, the borers and you talked about correct identification and, and further work's been undertaken. You also talked about diseases and other diseases will be coming up in the screening process, et cetera. That's right. So we, we targeted these diseases because they have been ones that have not had any funding put towards them for development since dot. Um, the only one that isn't wasn't there was Ramu Stunt and that one we added because um, we know already that we can improve that and we're the only people that. So the the other diseases that we're looking at, they really haven't had any um, funding in Australia to look at for upgrading the diagnostics. It's just something that we probably would have eventually got to. Um, eventually being, you know, in 20 or 30 years, we may have been able to go through all of these, but having this rural R&D funding has really allowed us to get these things done in a very timely manner, ordered, and we'll be able to have some really discrete outputs, which are unrelated to the Sentinel until you want to interrogate Sentinel yeah. um, sample. And that we're, because we're doing it in parallel, by the end of the project, um, that's where it will begin, start to become really interesting about that, you know, about that using it more closely together. Excellent. And also the reason the moth borer stuff is so progressed is that they uh, were only um, in the project for about 18 months. They had a very discreet part, uh, discreet part of the project, which was just in the first 18 months to two years of the project. Um, so that's why all of that work is kind of fin almost finished now. Okay. All right. Excellent.
Um, thanks for that, guys. Are there any other questions for Shakira or Nick? Um, if anybody is interested, um, I have worked out a way to play our little trailer, Shaq. So if anybody is interested, um, I will play that at the end if there are no questions, but I'll let James sign off on that. If, uh... Okay. I don't think there's any more questions. All right, on that note, um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. So Nick is just going to play back a bit of footage here. Am I right, Nick? Yep. So do you want to go for it? Can you hear it? Yeah, we can see it. So Nick, this is footage of the actual Sentinel in operation, is that correct? Yes. Um, so you can't hear it? No, I can't hear, can only see, Nick. Okay. Fortunately, the subtitles. Yes, yes. Um, I did have it playing with uh, actual play. Oh, that's our website. Yes, that's the website. Soon to be superseded by our new flashier website. Okay. Uh, I I tried to play the audio, but it's not working. So um, it's it's giving me an error. So okay. but you'll be able to see the um, different tracks that are on the uh, the central, and that is the deployment of the central uh, track. So if they want to listen to the audio and everything, Shakira, they can just go on the website? Yep, or they can access it through YouTube. Um, yeah, it's, we can also, if there's any mail out or any follow-ups um, through Sugar Research Australia, they can follow it through there. Excellent. We're going to update this video soon um, to include some of those new Sentinel units as well. So that will be coming soon. Yeah, so this was um, this was shot at our launch of the Sentinel, which was um, in Adelaide. Um, hence why we're standing around drinking wine in a vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, this is available on our on our website um, on our website here. And as uh, Shaq said, if you're interested in at any of the data trials. They're under here at the moment, but tomorrow I guess they're getting a new look. But that's where the um, the the video is as well, if you're interested. So that's at imatfest.com.au. All right, excellent. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and thanks for taking the time to be with us. Thank you. Thank you.